friends, guess what? You made it. You are here. This is Flip the Script, an epic week of innovative ideas to force the connection and bring communities closer together. Because if you can think it, you can flip it. I'm Jadi Ksa from Team Flip, and every day this week, we're diving into the specific areas. Today, we're looking at ways Flip can help us implement culturally responsive strategies to engage learners and adults through their connection of culture, language, and life experiences. Y'all ready? Let's flip the script. And welcome to Flip the Script. Today we're learning how Flip can help us become more culturally responsive. Joining me now are some of awesome Flip friends. They're experts in their craft. We have Chanel Johnson, Victor Hicks, and George Valenzuela. Why don't we start by having each of you introduce yourselves? Hello, hello. My name is Chanel Johnson. I live in Atlanta, Georgia. I currently work as an implementation manager for Explore Learning, which are tools such as Gizmos and Reflex Frack Science for us. And also I am a contractor where I work with several districts about science implementation and training. The last Flipgrid group I created was actually for a former district I worked in where we created PSAs, where students created PSAs for the COVID vaccine campaign that we were just running. My name is George Valenzuela and I live in Virginia and I'm an education coach, author and advocate and I teach at Old Dominion University down here in Norfolk, Virginia and I'm the lead coach at Lifelong Learning Defined. I also coach on behalf of ASCD, Solution Tree, Instructional Innovation Partners in Corwin and I'll be honest for all the newbies out there, I have not made my own flip group yet but I did make my first flip video for for our group here today. And if you're new to this, it's not difficult at all. Greetings, everybody. My name is Victor uh, Hicks, also known as Coach Hicks. Um, I am a proud resident of Decatur, Georgia. Um, I work as the founder and uh, computer science teacher and jack of all trades at Coding with Culture, uh, the HBCU Ready Computer Science and STEM program. And the last flip group I created was for my Oakwood University cohort. Um, they are currently doing the virtual design your HBCU unit and one of our digital artifacts we create are commercials for our HBCU. So they we use that and the group was where they posted their commercials. So glad to be here. I'm super excited. We have so many folks tuning in today. We have people from Libya, Egypt, Texas, even Mexico. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Please share photos, favorite moments, shout outs, questions, anything really. We're on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram. You can follow us at Microsoft Flip. Give us a shout out, give us some love, and let us know that you're here with us. I want to start by popping up a definition of culturally responsive education so that we can all start on a proper baseline. Culturally responsive education is using customs, characteristics, experiences, and perspectives as tools for better classroom instruction. This looks like relevancy and also diversifying your curriculum to include each of your learners and colleagues. It does not look like cultural appropriation. Now that we're all on the same page, let's get started. Here's our first topic of the day. I need to be and I need to be more culturally responsive when? All right, so I'll start with that answer. I believe we need to be more culturally responsive when it comes to even before students come into the classroom. And I preach a lot about culturally responsive teaching in the science classroom. So consider breaking those stereotypes, not with just your words, but with your actions. Who are actual scientists? What do scientists look like? Breaking the stereotypes that it's not just a particular race, it's not a particular gender, it's not even a particular age group of people that can be scientists. So we know that, but using your actions to show that, and you can do that by something simple as creating science groups in your classroom named after different scientists and making sure that those different scientists' names are diverse or different um, representations of people. So. I'll George, what do you have? Yeah, so I know that I have to be more culturally responsive when a student is not looking me in the eye. 
when a student or a group of students is not engaged in my instruction. You see, what culturally responsive teaching is, is an instructional pedagogy, is a pedagogical strategy that we use as teachers so we can engage learners. And so what we're trying to do here is we're trying to form learning partnerships with our students, but we can't do that in order to really give them. So a learning partnership means that we are giving them the problem solving strategies that they need in order to be successful and to achieve in our class. But we cannot form a learning partnership if we don't form a relationship first. And empathy is the very first step in any relationship. And so back to how I started, if my kids are not engaged in what I'm saying, they're not engaged in me, then it means that I am not being empathetic. Now, empathy is not to be confused with sympathy. Sympathy is to feel sorry for someone and their circumstance. Although there is a place for that, empathy is all about perspective taking, validating and honoring the experiences of, of students so we can form a relationship and then form the learning partnership. And in the adult world, you can look at relationships where there's no empathy. Even if people love each other, it's not harmonious and it doesn't work out in the long run. Victor, what are your thoughts? Well, I think I would speak to the computer science um, classroom in particular. I think um, one thing that I love about um, that particular genre that I work with is that we are asking students to take risks. And a lot of what we hear about why computer science education is necessary um, is to increase the presence of traditionally underrepresented groups within that area. So um, one of the things and I think just really being a um, reflective teacher, reflective educator, and seeing or making sure that uh, where students, as you mentioned, uh, are connecting to material and where they may not really, really, really engage in a way to take risks and try and learn new things. Um, so I realize at those points that there may be uh, things that as a teacher I thought were important, but I wanted to, uh, when I see those students not engaging as readily or not um, being willing to dive as deep into the material um, or take ownership over their learning, I have to use that moment as a teacher and say, well, where I may have thought I was doing things the right way, um, maybe there are some, some areas or some opportunities to connect with my student population. And again, I think all of the student population. So making sure that even if there are a few, one or two, that you may have to um, you know, reach a little bit deeper and say, okay, well, how do I, how do I engage that one student or that, that other student to make sure that they're seeing themselves in the curriculum, um, they're being given examples of success. I'm a huge supporter of them um, if they see it, they can be it. Um, but I think just really making sure that um, being reflective and realizing those opportunities when you may think that you are being culturally responsive, but there may be opportunities to um, to deepen that practice. Wow, you all are making my heart smile, especially with just the examples that you're giving on how to be an effective culturally responsive educator. I remember when I was in school and the classes that I paid the least attention to were those teachers who mispronounced my name. I always felt like you have day one and day two to really form those bonds and those relationships. And even if you mispronounced my name wrong on day one, you still had day two to just say, hey, Jadiksa, how do you pronounce your name? And so this is a topic that if you know me, you've heard me speak before, you know this resonates not only with me, but who I am as a person. And I cannot wait to share the rest of this conversation with the community. So let's move on to our next topic, which is a successful culturally responsive strategy I've implemented is. Well, all, well, all right. So my strategy that I love to use is actually called the lab coach strategy. And it's something that I like to use in the beginning of the year. And just to give an agreement to what George said about forming and establishing those positive relationships. Before I teach you, I need to know who you are. And with the lab coach strategy, it's actually two folds. One, I want every student to come in and recognize you're not taking a science class. You are practicing as a scientist. I want you to see who you are as a scientist, but who is this? what is a scientist? It is a person practicing science. So who are you as a person? So through this lab coach strategy, I like for them to take that time to tell me who you are. So, you know, I like to use the multiple intelligence test, you know, because in middle school, especially for me, this is that time where they love those personality tests or anything that tells them about themselves so they can form that identity. 
So, okay, let's take the multiple intelligence test. What else is there about you that you want me to know? Are you into anime? Do you like a certain type of music? Whatever you want to put on your lab code that I need to know, you put it on there because it tells me who you are, how you identify. And I also, and, and even going back to what you said, Yorissa, that with the name, I'm actually a middle namer. And it's important for me to know what name would you like to be addressed as? Would you, are you a first namer, middle namer like myself? I need that information because I believe that's the foundation of getting started before I teach anyone. So George, what do you have? All right, so I have a couple of strategies that are very simple, easy to use. So one is circle practice and the other one is getting to know each other with question prompts. And so part of my circle practice is a circle called opening my mail. And so we circle up right at the beginning of the day, all of the kids, all of the adults, whoever's there. And we just start one by one and letting each other know what we need from each other, what empathy we need in regards to how our day is going, how it started and what we would need so that that learning block would be effective. And you'd be surprised at some of the things that you hear young people say, like, I haven't eaten yet. Um, I lost a loved one. I lost a pet. And when that happens, the empathy really starts you know, flowing in the classroom. And remember, empathy is the first step in the pedagogical transformation of culturally responsive teaching. It's the first step is knowing someone and understanding where they are coming from. It doesn't mean that we agree with them in their lifestyle, but it, it means that we honor them. And so that opportunity of hearing, you know, of opening mail, it's also great for really learning and um, gleaning insights into the lives and into their habits and into what their interests are. And the other one is getting to know each other um, using question prompts. And so I like a lot of question prompts in the beginning of a lesson that really connect what the learning is to something in their life. And Hayaritza said about um, um, her name, I, I always ask this question, what is the origin of your name and why was it given to you? And so I always model that first. Some young people, some adults feel marginalized, feel unseen, unheard, and they just have to see it done. And so I just say this, that my name is George, but it's spelled with a J, so really it's Jorge, but I go by George. And so they're like, well, why is that? Well, here's why. My dad, he was born in Texas. His name is George with a G. He met my mom in South America when he was in the military. And you know the story. And she ended up having me in the Bronx, New York. And she wanted to name me after my dad, but she didn't know how to spell George with a G. So she spelled it with a J, Jorge but she always called me George. And so that's my story. And then allow me to model mine allows them to then explain theirs. And that's how empathy in our community that is more responsive to um, everyone's culture begins. Victor, what are your thoughts? Well, one strategy I like to use in my classroom is I call uh, creativity around community. Um, and I think one of the ways that I love uh, or I like to implement or use FLIP um, and, and where it kind of makes it or ties it into the culture, the responsive piece is that culture is at the core. So I think if you really want to get authentic representations of where students are comfortable, things that really make them um, who they are at, at their core, it, you have to kind of give them the autonomy and the, the um, I guess, the creativity even in, in, in resource of how they do that communication. And then I think that way their, their natural pieces of who they are will come out. So when we talk about how that ties into the computer science classroom, one of the things that I'm huge about is giving kids meaningful outcomes. So we know that every kid is not going to necessarily become a coder or a programmer. But one thing that we do know, um, as evident by our workforce trans, you know, transforming day in and day out, is that being able to serve in these project teams and one of those one of those 21st century skills that we want them to develop is communication. But I think that in order to allow students, again, to see themselves in the computer science class or STEM classroom, um, to feel authentic in who they are, to feel um, validated in how they, they authentically uh, contribute to those project teams. And I think FLIP does a great job because, again, if students want to use music um, to express themselves. And again, it, 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 that, um, that tool or that benefit 
stretches across all different types of things. So whether it be a you know computer science lesson where you want kids to say, hey, how did you feel about taking this risk as you were debugging? Um, or if I want them to communicate a very specific outcome, um, the fact that FLIP has so many versatile tools and pieces and functions, um, again, it allows students to kind of be who they are naturally. Now, the reason I think that naturally piece is important because as a teacher, I feel like sometimes when we spell that out, it becomes like a situation where students feel kind of in that fishbowl, right? So, you know, I think it doesn't come across as genuine or they feel that they there has to be some thought process when generally, you know, being responsive to one's culture or, or, or recognizing one's culture um, is them in their most natural environment. So I think FLIP kind of being able to give that tool to them and say, hey, you know, this is what I need. This is the feedback that I need from you. And now, boom, you know, here's your opportunity to do with it um, as you as you see fit and how you as you can communicate the um, the best way you, you know, you see, you know how you see fit. So, um, yeah, it's been great. <laughs> Here I go smiling again, just teeth, right? The chat is like you guys are getting so many shout outs, especially with Chanel mentioning the lab code strategy with George mentioning empathy versus sympathy. And I'm just thinking to myself, these are some awesome ideas and strategies to use, especially during that first week of school when you're first getting to know your students, but also to get to know yourself, right? To me, the beginning of the school year is also a way to restart. It is a way to like throw back last school year and everything else you dealt with and to welcome students with open arms, but also to acknowledge their experiences. Who am I? What are you going to contribute to my classroom and to just create that loving and open space? With that being said, let's move on to the last topic. What is one way you can use FLIP to foster cultural competency? Well, all right, this example is going to be geared towards teachers. Um, and I say that in this way, I worked at the district level where I supported science teachers, math teachers, and this particular um, strategy was for my department chairs. Because one of the things we have to recognize when we're in a district, that in itself is, it, is a culture, that's a community, but how often do you get to interact and talk with teachers who aren't in your building? So you have all of these department chairs who don't know each other, but why reinvent the work? Let's build a community. So what I built for them was called the department chair yearbook. And inside of that group, I will have different prompts. One prompt may be, hey, let's get the party started. What song represents you when you're trying to get the party started? And you'll see all of these different, you know, songs from different times, from different cultures. Because one of the things we have to recognize that one, culture doesn't always equal race. So keep that in mind. And then I'm at that point where I have students who are old enough to be teachers and I have teachers who are still, who taught me, who are still in the classroom. So those are different generational experiences. So bring them together, right? So using the department chair yearbook strategy for FLIP is one of my favorites. It brings us all together. It kind of opens the doors for collaboration and it's been working. George, I know you're gonna blow it out. What's, what do you have? Well, I was just thinking it's hard to go after you, but, um, you know, this is for all my teachers out there. Um, there's an important quote by, by John Dewey that I really try to live in my life. We do not learn from experience. We learn from reflecting on experience. And so I incorporate a reflection, a reflection meta moment or metacognition moment at the end of every activity every um, conversation, every design challenge, every PD activity. And I really can see making a flip group, which I haven't done yet, and allowing learners to just reflect in a way that's authentic to them, whether it's a video, whether it's an audio message, or it's just text. And so I, I really seeing it helping for reflection, for metacognition. Victor? I feel like I need to get my my win machine out, have my Beyonce moment after those, you know, those first two answers. Like, I mean, what am I supposed to do with that now? But um, one of the ways I definitely I think I've used um, Flip uh, most recently that I really, really enjoyed um, is during our students um, designing HBCU um, PBL, as I mentioned a little bit earlier. And so to get a little bit dive a little bit deeper in how we use that, 
Um, you know, one of the big parts about STEM is we want kids to see these, you know, real life working examples. So they're actually introduced as we present um, the unit of strategy actually learned from from George and making those projects as real life as as you know as possible. Um, and so the students actually step into the shoes of an HBCU president. And so what that flip um, does is as they you know create the different artifacts, so they go through a business pitch um, presentation where they actually have to present the idea for to get funding for their HBCU. So they shoot that you know minute pitch video and flip grid. Um, so again, as they're going through this reflective process, you know a lot of times we use, we get tied into those paper bound journals. But for some students, I don't think you really get their authentic self. And as a teacher, looking at that as you know opportunities to shape instruction as you kind of move through that that project based learning unit um, getting that video feedback or getting that again you know where the students are kind of able to communicate um, in the area that's most often or in the way excuse me that's most authentic to them I think you definitely get more um, valuable data as a teacher right so as you're going through that you know what does the next day of instruction look like so as I can go through these you know and again I'm not breaking my my real life experiences I'm staying within the the theme or the you know the the topic of what we're doing so it does the kids don't lose that momentum but as a teacher i'm able to kind of track progress right to see if you know one when they're coding their hbcu website did they get those necessary um skills because i can look at that flip grid video and use that as or excuse me flip video and use that as um a way to you know shape instruction so that the kids are moving along most beneficially so yeah a lot of different ways you can implement it within um definitely is that final product but also as reflective um steps as kids are going through that pbl unit as well victor i love your business pitch idea and it actually takes us back to one thing that chanel said that marianne green pointed out if they can see it they can be it so why hbcus well, I think they serve two purposes. So of, of as a proud product of two historically black colleges, um, I really affirmed who I was as an educator, right? Um, and as I saw and I thought about some of those key uh, elements to my experience, I realized that it spoke to so many of my students. So I had students of all backgrounds um, who I knew would benefit from the family type environment on an HBCU campus. And I think that's one myth I want to make sure that I, you know, dispel is that it's HBCUs are not only for black students. Um, the historically, uh, the H in HBCU ties into because there was a time when, of course, education was not integrated. So um, these schools were founded to help uh, to make sure that everyone was able to get a college education. The beautiful piece that came from that is culturally now you have these environments where you have professors that are very similar to your K to eight um, teachers and classrooms and cultures. And again, there are students who come from all backgrounds, all races, all you know, socioeconomic backgrounds that need that little bit of extra care and support um, to help get through it. So I think in my classroom, you know, it's really, really cool content to learn about because HBCUs are so historically relevant. Um, but also it is giving kids a way to, again, kind of getting that subliminal message again that if they see it, they can be it. So not only can you be a computer scientist or a scientist, but here's a institution that is set up to make sure that you succeed in that space from your professors to the president of the university to the, you know, the lunch ladies, everybody's there to see you. So as we're asking you to trailblaze this space, here's the school to do it. Here's the final outcome and here's some really cool things that you can learn as we build these skills to get you ready um, to kind of complete that experience. I'm going to stop because I could talk about HBCUs all day. We'll be on here. <laughs> we'll be on here until tomorrow. I appreciate your share out because honestly, I'm learning so much about HBCUs through following you on Twitter. Um, that wasn't something that resonated with my family. We were immigrants. We came from Panama. So going to a historically black college wasn't like, you know, important. It was just going to college. So thank you so much for sharing. As we wrap up, I'd like I'd love to empower our viewers with some new flip vision. How can they start to recognize moments where flip can foster cultural competency within their communities? Victor, I'll start with you. Well, I think it's really just being intentional, I know, in, in the lesson planning for me. So, you know, when we look at some of the different aspects of a lesson as you guys are actually going through that process of writing it out or typing it out or, you know, creating your slide presentation, really being intentional in what are some ways that I can change or implement 
um, this new tool um, with some of the practices that I've used. And so to kind of give a very concrete example for teachers is that journaling piece. You know, one of the things that we like to, you know, at the end of a lesson, George mentioned is a very, very valuable tool. Um, you know, but as you're lesson planning, making sure that you're putting that into your notes so that you remember, OK, well, instead of, you know, kind of using the strategy I've used for the past five years and the kids go get their composition books, let me be very, very intentional of making flip a part of my day to day instruction. So it doesn't necessarily look, you know, kids don't get lost in the I call it the field trip experience where it's a really, really cool thing that you only do at the end of the project. You know, it's a way to really implement it. I think, you know, for ELA teachers as you're doing read alouds, there's so many different ways that I think if you're thinking intentionally as you're planning um, that you can really find ways or excuse me, use find ways to make flip a valuable part of your um, your day to day instruction. So, yeah. Love that. Thank you so much. Chanel, what do you think? When is flip the right tool to help people become more culturally responsive? All the time, all the time. But a specific example that I like to think of in just the STEM classroom, such as science, math, engineering, technology, wherever, I like to think in the beginning of a lesson when we are engaging learners where that we're getting an idea of what they're thinking. So in science, we like to start off with the phenomena, right? And a phenomena can be anything. And what I like to do, I would like to just show that phenomena, show that video and allow students, you know, just brain dump. What do you see? What are you thinking? Why do you think that happened? Because what we learn in science oftentimes is that there are misconceptions, right? And those misconceptions can come from shared experiences or learned experiences, what have you, or just things they thought may have happened or things they may have saw on a movie. So this is that time for me to assess where you are or what um, you bring to the table on what you know. And this isn't a time for me to judge to say, you're right, you're wrong, you're this, you're that. No, this is just for you to come to a safe place. And that's what I like to consider flip as a safe place to say what's on your mind, say what you're thinking. So in the beginning, students have engaged in that phenomenon. They're explaining to you what they think is happening, what they think is going to happen and why. And I personally think that maybe you don't have the comments on or you can. It's really up to you. Um, but being careful about judging if a student is right or wrong and just creating that safe space for them to share their thinking, because what does that do? That lets them know it's OK for me to say what I think and not feel judged, especially in science, because sometimes we get a bad rap that people think science are geniuses. We're not. We're just out here in the world making things happen uh, the best that we can and through experimentation. So give them a safe space to think and share what they're thinking. And you hit the nail on the head. Science is all about experimenting, which means every answer that you receive is not going to be correct. And that's what learning is. In order for us to really figure out what the correct answer is, it takes a lot of trials. And George, what do you think? All right, so as an ed tech or as an instructional education coach, I'm often in districts where they have a lot of technology. And the teachers always say, George, there is so much ed tech here. Where do I even start? And so one of the things that I did in one of my SD articles is I categorize ed tech into three categories, learning tools, formative assessment tools, and transfer tools. And to be honest, I can see flip in all three as a learning tool. Like, let's say a student has never made a flip like me. Right. That's a learning tool. Right. If a student knows and it's being um, weaved into you know, reflection or into instruction, it's now a formative assessment tool that a teacher can really determine if the learning is sticking. But it's also a transfer tool. It could be a presentation tool where they're showing off what the final product is. And so it's a diverse tool um, as I'm learning here. And I think it's powerful and it's right where you are. Meet yourself where you are and where your students are. And I just want to say one more thing about sympathy. There's nothing wrong with sympathy, but it does very little to improve someone's situation. Empathy is the key that we need in culturally responsive teaching. It starts with empathy. It doesn't even start with the lesson. It starts with understanding, listening, hearing what's going on, not adding to it, not taking away from it, letting it be what it is so that I can now go and make better instructional decisions. But I think most importantly, I can go back and become a better person. Thank you. And it's definitely not about passing judgment or making assumptions about our students' experiences, right? I'm looking in the chat and folks are saying, keep going, but 
we're running out of time. George, Chanel, Victor, thank you so much for your time today. I want to celebrate each of you for helping us all become culturally responsive. We're all learning this together. And Flip can help us learn this even faster. So thank you for sharing the love and your expertise. Thank you with so us. much for having us. That part. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you. As I said, FLIP can help your communities become more culturally responsive. So my challenge to you, as you're walking through your day to test out your FLIP vision, ask yourself, could I create a FLIP group to address this problem? An easy way to start, join our FLIP group. Creators of all kinds have shared their big wins using FLIP to bring their communities closer. Head to flip.com slash flip the script 2022 to join the fun. Every response you add will give you a chance to win some fresh new swag. Today has been so much fun. Thank you for spending your precious time with us. And on behalf of Flip, our amazing guests, Chanel, Victor, and George, thank you for joining us and have a beautiful rest of your day. Bye. Bye-bye. <laughs>